Hey, so welcome everybody. Uh, some people are going to keep trickling in. I know uh, 630 can be a challenging start time if people are cooking dinner or, you know, running from place to place. But uh, thank you for those who joined us here tonight. Um, I'm so excited for this presentation um, and for both the speakers today. They are both good friends of FIST and have been supporters for a long time. So I'm personally very happy uh, that they're here. Uh, in terms of just some housekeeping stuff, this is a meeting style, which means uh, you can take your video off or keep it on. Um, we ask that you keep yourselves muted while the speakers are talking. Uh, we will give a chance for questions at the end. Uh, if you think of a question you think you might forget, that's fine. Just put it in the chat box um, and then we'll go through all the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so for those of you who may know, uh, and for those of you who don't, uh, BIST, a lot of the work we do is uh, we're able to do it because we have really amazing community supporters. And one of our most amazing community supporters is PIA Law. They are our platinum corporate sponsor. Um, and by sponsoring us, we're able to put on workshops such as this, uh, such as the art show that's coming up. A lot of the programs, uh, the drop-in programs, et cetera, are all able to happen because of the support of PIA Law. So I want to take a moment to thank PIA Law. Um, and we have a representative of PIA here today, Brandon Peterson, who's a lawyer with McLeish Orlando. Uh, so I'm going to give you a bit of information about Brandon. Um, when Brandon was a young boy, uh, two of his family members were killed in a motor vehicle crash calls, caused by a negligent driver. This has motivated Brandon to pursue a career as a personal injury lawyer so that he can advocate on behalf of others affected by negligence. Brandon received an honors Bachelor of Arts degree from Western University, majoring in political science and also earned his law degree from Western. Brandon started with McLeish Orlando in 2019 as a summer student, returned for his articles in 2020, and soon after being called to the bar in June 2021, he joined McLeish Orlando as an associate. I'm very pleased to say and very grateful that Brandon is also a member of our fundraising committee for the Brain Injury Society of Toronto's Birdies for Brain Injury. So he's new this year and has already contributed quite a bit. So thank you, Brandon. Um, and I'll pass it on to you to introduce our uh, guest for this evening. Thank you, Melissa, for the introduction. As Melissa said, my name is Brandon Peterson, and I'm a lawyer at McLeish Orlando. McLeish Orlando is proud to support BIST as a member firm of PIA Law. I'm excited to be here tonight and to introduce the speaker for today's webinar. Hung Pang believes that every person is capable of improving their physical situation. He is passionate about developing unique strategies through critical analysis and assessment to help his clients achieve their personal goals. This client-centered approach helps to guide his physiotherapy practice. He is consistently fine-tuning his client's sessions and discovering new ways to access their goals despite physical or mental barriers. His experience in varsity sports and working as a research assistant alongside physiotherapists at McMaster University gave him a close look at the role rehabilitation experts play in improving the lives of people with injuries and disabilities. Those experiences shaped his perspective on the importance of health-related quality of life. It also helped him to choose his career path. Welcome, Hung. Wow, that, that was quite the intro. Thank you so much, Brandon. I really appreciate that. That's, uh, that's a lot. Um, thank you, Best, uh, for having me uh, tonight. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks so much for everyone in attendance and for those uh, slowly trickling in. We will uh, answer some questions at the end as well. And so usually I have my partner in crime, Kyle Whaley, the uh, founder of uh, Propel Physiotherapy. Uh, but today, uh, coincidentally, he's at a, he's, he's coaching a uh, hockey game for his kids who are physically active, engaged in exercise. So we can say that he's leading by example, or the, the next generation is helping to lead by example with regards to physical activity and exercise. Uh, as Brandon mentioned, I'm a registered physiotherapist. I'm also the managing director of uh, Propel Physiotherapy, and uh, I'm very excited today to speak about something I'm uh, truly passionate about. So what is physiotherapy, or uh, what is Propel Physiotherapy rather? Uh, we're a collective of ther collection of therapists, some physiotherapists, some massage therapists, 
some exercise therapists. And we, we provide physical rehabilitation uh, to people living with catastrophic neurological and complex orthopedic injuries. We also do provide some yoga therapy and yoga classes. Some of our registered physios are mindfulness coaches. We do hold niche practices in pelvic floor physiotherapy and pediatric physiotherapy. Uh, and a point that we, you know, were driving home a lot during the, the height of the pandemic was that we do offer community-based services uh, in the home, in residence, at long-term care facilities. And we do uh, house quite a bit of technology at our clinics, Pons, Kyogo, and Lightgate. And we can get into that a little bit later, but for now, we'll focus on uh, physical activity and exercise. So I think, you know, everyone understands that the brain is uh, it's a really important structure to our body, right? And I think we understand, we, we always have these analogies of the brain being the computer, the brain being the circuit board, the brain being the, 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 the big organ that really, really helps us do a lot of uh, important activities, conscious or unconscious, uh, and that the brain influences the body. So I really hope that by the end of this little uh, info session, we also appreciate how the body can influence the brain. The relationship is recipro reciprocal and one should not go without the other. But how do we positively influence both to get the best results after a traumatic brain injury uh, or an acquired brain injury? So some goals for tonight. Uh, we wanna discuss some common physical and neurological issues uh, after an acquired uh, or traumatic brain injury. We want to review some uh, physiotherapy guidelines and practices that can be implemented to address these issues, some uh, symptom and si uh, symptom management. Uh, I hope that we can also leave here knowing that movement is a form of medicine uh, and that uh, the benefits of exercise and physical activity do have a specific and correct dosage. Um, and in the end, as things are opening up and as uh, restrictions are being lifted, perhaps we can garner a little bit more direction on getting movement and physical activity into our typical day. Uh, that is breaking down some barriers. So um, after a brain injury, one may experience the following uh, signs or symptoms from a scale of like mild to really severe. Um, many people experience whole body pain or unrelenting pain, soreness and headaches associated with the injury. Um, many of our clients report balance dysfunction or dizziness, uh, feeling unsteady on their legs or unable to ambulate the same way that they used to, um, decreased mobility and movement, and overall a feeling of decreased strength and endurance, and perhaps reported as I feel fatigued or I get tired a lot easier, a lot quicker. I'm just not the same as I was before. So these are uh, some of the you know, signs and symptoms one may report after sustaining a uh, traumatic brain injury. And we want to know, well, how does physical therapy end up uh, helping us? How do we address this list of issues uh, potentially that um, one of our clients may be experiencing? So pain, soreness, and or headaches, there are many physiotherapy uh, interventions that can be applied. Uh, one popularized intervention is manual therapy, which is uh, a hands-on approach to literally uh, to the person's uh, body. Um, so in this case, if we were addressing someone's cervical spine, uh, we would handle their uh, neck or head or uh, muscles in that region uh, using techniques such as soft tissue release, massage, uh, joint mobilization, and gentle stretching. This helps <laughs> to uh, improve some of the alignment and, and decrease some of the postural asymmetries that one may experience after a uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, and it also opens up the avenue so that people have uh, the ability to engage in a tailored movement program, which is really a fancy way of saying like uh, a physical activity or, a, or an exercise program uh, to help improve more uh, permanent changes. Uh, these movement programs also improve the endurance after an injury uh, to the muscles or other structures associated with it. Uh, often in our uh, physiotherapy sessions, we are teaching some form of self-pacing or energy conservation 
and education uh, and activity guidance to our clients. So things to do, perhaps some things to maybe uh, not do or avoid at this part, at this point in their recovery uh, to help alleviate some of the pain or soreness or even the headaches that they're experiencing. Some of our clinicians are trained in modality applications uh, such as acupuncture uh, or uh, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization to really help decrease the pain and soreness that one experiences throughout the day. And some of these modalities have shorter term uh, effects and or long term uh, relief as well. And one of the practices that our mindfulness coach you know, has really uh, taught us is um, home strategies with regards to mindfulness uh, meditation. So this comes in the form of body scans, breathing awareness, and it's, it really helps a client address their pain and soreness on their terms and on their time. Um, the more we are able to educate our clients on how they can be uh, advocates for themselves, we see that their progression uh, to their uh, goals is a lot quicker and that they are able to um, address their physical uh, barriers a lot better. So in our next slide, um, I do have a little bit of a three minute guided meditation. So you don't need to like close your eyes or really get too into it if you don't want to, but if you do, feel free to shut off the, uh, the camera or mute yourself. But uh, it's, it's a three minute guided meditation from one of our colleagues, Shrey Vizier. Uh, he's a registered physiotherapist and a mindfulness coach. And essentially it brings us through uh, a mindfulness uh, meditation session where you know, we're trying to be in the moment. We're trying to be uh, assessing and being involved in what we feel uh, through our body, what we feel throughout our mind, and most importantly, not being judgmental on what we actually uh, sense or, or what we're going through. And this really helps to bring a person uh, back into the proverbial moment. Uh, it helps to stop our mind from racing 10, 15 minutes ahead of ourselves, right? I think we catch ourselves often doing that. Uh, surprise, surprise, it's a Monday, right? Beginning of the week, we're probably already thinking about what's go, what are we going to do for Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, all these other days. This three minute quick little guided meditation I, I find is, is appropriate, like mainly because you can do it anywhere um, and, and it doesn't take too long. So I'm just going to play the clip um, and you guys let me know if uh, you can hear it. can hear it but it's kind of muffled oh it, it can ultimately help to calm the mind and relax the body especially in these uncertain times let's begin by settling into a comfortable position gently closing your eyes or keeping them open with a soft gaze we will begin by taking three deep breaths. Taking a deep inhale to the count of four and exhaling at the count of six. In, filling the lungs and chest and out. One more deep breath here. And out. And now focusing your attention to the sensations in your body, starting from your head and face. Seeing if you can melt some tension lying here with each out breath. Perhaps letting the tension melt over your eyebrows, your jaw, your forehead, and your face. And then gently moving your attention to your neck and your shoulders. And with each out breath, letting the tension roll off your shoulders as you exhale.
If you are noticing any pain or discomfort here or anywhere else in the body, just noticing it for what it is. Circling your area of pain, stiffness, or achiness. Trying not to judge what's here. Just noticing what's there and gently returning to your breath. <clears throat> and as this practice comes to an end, bringing your focus back to the room, opening your eyes and noticing how your body feels now. So that's just a little kind of like tidbit of how mindfulness meditation or a guided meditation practice can really calm your breath down, take away a little bit of anxiety. And we know that those things are uh, associated with self-perception of pain. Um, you know, the heightened parasympathetic nervous system uh, needs to kind of be drawn down. And this is an active way uh, some of our clients do so. Welcome to this three-minute All right. So another uh, component uh, after an acquired or traumatic brain injury, uh, some of our client, clients also report are balance deficits, dizziness, and Im immobility. Um, some people just don't feel as great on their feet. They don't feel as steady. They don't feel as confident. There's a fear of falling, which then you know, elicits an even bigger um, drawback to wanting to to do anything that requires some sort of balance, uh, you know, ability. Um, and the way we often coach our clients into improving their uh, balance uh, abilities is through targeted exercises and targeted movements. So it is a, more of an active approach. You don't get better at balancing or standing or walking or, you know, navigating uh, on two feet without doing so. It's all in a, a component of being safe first uh, and practicing novel balance exercises and or techniques. So I think popularized, we'll see more of like the yoga poses, or the yoga positions, and that might not be for everyone. Uh, it, it's certainly not for me all the time, right? And some of our clients don't really gravitate to that kind of, uh, you know, structure. So perhaps it's more uh, addressing their gait aids and making sure that footwear and the setup uh, of their external environment is really, really set up for success. Uh, and perhaps it's using that and tying it into some more uh, palatable exercises for them. Um, you know, single leg stance, practicing walking uh, towards the sides, or even using resistance bands uh, to challenge their uh, balance as well. Um, I think one of the, the biggest things to really keep in mind is our physiotherapy team does address uh, the various systems associated with balance. So sensation, proprioception, vision, vestibular health. So your inner ear, is that playing a factor in your uh, balance right now? And muscular strength and endurance. So if all of these components uh, to your biological balance health is going well, we will see improvements in, the, uh, in your ability to balance, to walk, to feel more confident in, in what you're doing uh, upright. There are other components to uh, balance and, and falls risks as well, such as medication, environmental factors. Uh, that we also want to address with your team. Uh, and with that last point, we talked about uh, some people experiencing decreased strength and endurance. And some of the strategies we'll implement as physiotherapists with our clients is to do some formal strength training. Um, and this is not necessarily like going into the gym or, or setting up a huge exercise uh, you know, depot in your home. Uh, so we, we can really get strong using uh, everyday items, things that we find around the home, and perhaps with minimal setup. That's the key. Um, strength training doesn't work if you're not doing it. So uh, if, if, if the barriers to doing it are all the things that I said earlier, then we want to take away all those barriers. Some examples are smaller resistance bands and or using your body weight to improve your strength uh, and endurance perhaps uh, some yoga balls and uh, mats just to eat up a little bit of space in the home for a quick setup, using a chair wall or countertop for support for those that are 
um, not as uh, well balanced to do strength training. And this is the, the biggest one. It's, it's finding our clients sweet spot of exercise modification. Not everyone can do the ideal push up or squat or lunge. Uh, so is there a modification we can teach and, and go with our, uh, go with our clients into their homes or into their places that they do like to exercise and provide that uh, instruction. Um, simple things that we can do for ourselves are walking programs, any outdoor activities, uh, group programs as they're coming back, fingers crossed. Uh, and, uh, you know, the last point here to really drive home with uh, strength and endurance training is the importance of uh, consistency, discipline, and accountability. Big words, uh, obviously easier said than done. Um, but we, we do see from our clients, uh, the ones that are super consistent, uh, disciplined, or have a form of accountability with a friend, with a family member, or even with their own therapist on when they're going to do their exercises, uh, they do get their goals and they are able to progress uh, a lot quicker and a lot faster. Um, so this is, we don't need to actually do this full gamut of, of exercises that uh, one of our exercise physiologists is going to show us, but this is an example of how um, um, some of the movements and exercises can be performed uh, and modified for some of our clients. Let me take a quick look here. There is no sound. I don't know if we... Oh. <laughs> Two. There's no sound right now. Okay. No. And you can still hear me though. I can hear you. Can okay, hear perfect. Her. Yeah. There's actually not the, the instructions are pretty big. Like there, she's just just Shri is just describing what she's doing with regards to the exercise band. Uh, she's going to have a shoulder width apart and she's practicing basic postural exercises with the Ooh, uh, muscles at the back of the deltoids and the uh, shoulder blades. So she's pulling them apart. The modification here is really just sitting on a chair. So your balance is completely safe. You're not going to um, fear falling uh, and you get a chance to practice some of the more isolated muscles in that position. I know we said questions at the end, but I have a question. Yeah. Uh, these videos, are they on your, how can we share yeah. them with our folks? Yeah, they're on our, our YouTube page. So okay. you can get on can there and yeah, yeah, I can totally send links. I can send anything that we, we need to, to get. And actually it'll be in a, in the future slide. There's like, I know this is a, a time where, oops, it's a time where, you know, the people are looking for, um, Kind of like a, a sample or, or or something that they can try out on their own. Certainly, we have that uh, on our on our uh, social media and our uh, our YouTube page. Perfect. If, yeah. yeah, we will share it. That's great. Oh, totally. Yeah, no, that's great. Um. Okay, this is a busy page, and it's a busy page for a reason. Uh, there are so many exercise and physical activity recommendations on time and intensity that it gets really confusing, right? And depending on, you know, kind of which sample population you fall in, into, uh, physicians, PhDs, the ivory towers can really make some broad stroke recommendations, right? So we see in the uh, CSUP Canadian uh, Physical Activity Guidelines for the average 18 to 64 year old uh, person, um, you're, you're trying to get 150 minutes in a week, um, uh, of moderate to vigorous exercise. There's a list of examples, you know, maybe it's a fast walk, it gets your heart rate up. Um, maybe it's a, you know, a jog, maybe it's playing a sport that you really like. You want to try to keep it within that uh, 10 minute intervals and you can break it up uh, throughout, uh, throughout the week. Um, if we take a look at some of the physical activity guidelines for people living with spinal cord injury, it changes a little bit. Uh, what is the limits on or the intensities that are required to have positive impacts on people living with spinal cord injury? We see it's, uh, you know, twice a week aerobic training to twice a week uh, strength, and, uh, strength and conditioning for major muscle groups. Uh, and it ranges from uh, your novice level to a little bit more of an advanced level. And then 
on our uh, spectrum with regards to brain injury, um, a couple of studies have shown that <clears throat> three to five times per week at an intensity of 40 to 70% of peak oxygen uptake, which is like, that's really tough to judge if you're just trying to exercise on your own at home, uh, using a 13 out of 20 rating on the RPE, uh, Borg RPE scale. Um, and that's, I think that part is a good part to have. That's a self um, reported scale of, uh, you know, how intense you're working. And it is correlated with some of the uh, heart rate. So 13 out of, out of 20, it's described as somewhat difficult. You can continue to do it for a longer duration. However, if you tried to talk, you might feel a little bit difficult to string together your entire conversation. Um, and the duration ranges. It's a larger range for the group with a uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, 20 to 60 minutes, uh, three to five times per week. And I believe this range is due to the fact that it's, you know, it's such a spectrum, right? Uh, and, and some days are better than others. Let's, let's, you know, put that into perspective. Some days we feel good. We can exercise a little bit more do more physical activity. And then there are other days due to various reasons we can't, right? So that time or the duration of 20 to 60 minutes, three to five times a week gives us a little bit more flexibility with that. So I've been preaching about movement, physical activity, and act exercise. Why is it so good? Uh, why do we want to do it? And why do we want to keep consistent and disciplined with it, especially after a traumatic brain injury? Um, for those of you who have had the opportunity to do exercise, uh, I think we can all agree for one reason or another, um, it improves your mood, right? You feel good about yourself after you exercise. It increases those built-in feel-good chemicals. So, uh, you know, dopamine, serotonin, all that stuff um, improves. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to control weight or improve your weight. Uh, it stabilizes uh, or decreases uh, when exercising uh, regularly. It combats and improves most uh, known diseases, both physical and mental. So um, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, depression, anxiety. Um, it increases the body's relaxation response, uh, addresses the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, and it helps to regulate elevated heart rate and blood pressure. It also improves your cognition and mental acuity. Uh, if anyone's had that, you know, runner's high or, uh, you know, that really good exercise session where, you know, after you feel tired, but you feel sharp, right? That's what they're trying to describe. Um, boosts your energy. Uh, improve addressing the uh, feelings of fatigue. Uh, it improves your endurance and fitness after completing light and uh, high resistance weight training, as well as long duration aerobic exercise. Sleep. How many of us have had better sleep if we've had a good uh, exercise or physical activity session? Uh, it improves sexual dysfunction, so circula uh, improving circulating uh, hormone levels. And it's our first line of defense for chronic or persistent pain. Um, surprise, surprise, regular exercisers report lower levels of pain and improved function. And this is a topic we often get ourselves into with uh, a lot of our clients who might be uh, ha uh, having chronic traumatic brain injury. So they've lived with their traumatic brain injury for a really long time. And they ask us, like, when I'm doing these movements, sometimes, yeah, it's not the most comfortable, right? Uh, and sometimes it might feel a little bit sore after, but it's sore in a good way. And then we start talking about distinguishing between, you know, good muscular soreness and the chronic maybe pain that they experience. And one thing always comes out at the end of the uh, other side of the tunnel where it's uh, a decision made by these successful uh, clientele where they, they would rather exercise and be a little bit stronger and, and have a disciplined physical activity uh, and or movement program and have a little bit of soreness than to just be weaker and still have that same soreness. So um, I think that kind of dialogue and discussion that the clients have with their therapists is really important. And the way that we frame uh, physical activity uh, and or exercise is also really important. Um, many of our clients previously uh, were not uh, consistent exercises or not gym goers or not athletes or didn't like playing sports. So we really do need to find a way that's um, uh, salient uh, to them 
and to so that they uh, feel good with their uh, physical activity program. All right. And I think the biggest one is uh, benefits of exercise from a traumatic brain injury perspective, neurogenesis, right? BDNF alpha uh, is uh, pr promoted when you do exercise uh, at certain intensities. And that's a protein that helps with a neurogenesis. It creates more connections in your brain and makes you essentially a little bit smarter and uh, improves that neuroplastic approach to healing. Some options for exercise and physical activity. As I said before, your activity doesn't need to uh, be structured. Go out and do something fun. I think that's always some, a missing component sometimes when we get really stuck in the rut uh, of the literature. Uh, walking, wheeling, biking, cross-country skiing, tobogganing. Um, some, some things that got a little bit more popularized throughout the uh, years was like walk a mall. So there's that huge social component, right? You get to hang out with some buds. Uh, walk throughout a mall and, and have some great dialogue while you're continuing with a, 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 an intensity that's meaningful enough. Trails or hikes, gardening is a really, really uh, po uh, popular and, and great one to have and great one to encourage. Um, attending the gym, uh, doing cardio or resistance training, that's more of the traditional approach. Uh, joining a Zumba, yoga, or dance class virtually or in person. Um, I can speak from ex experience. Uh, my parents, when they first joined their Zuma class, first intimidated by it, and now I can't get them off of it. So uh, they, they speak nothing uh, but really, really high praise for Zumba uh, classes. Uh, tai Chi and yoga, something that uh, not only improves balance, but can improve your strength and conditioning as well, depending on the level and the intensity that you bring it to. And I think importantly here, it's, you know, we, we as physiotherapists can promote all of these different kinds of exercises or physical activities, but we understand there are some pretty practical barriers to addressing this. Time is a huge one, right? We're all busy. Everyone's got an agenda. Everyone's trying to get their life in order. Um, so some of the strategies we've implemented with our clients is to have some sort of activity pal, whether or not it's a virtual thing, like a, a Fitbit or, or another person keeping you accountable um, and or joining groups to keep you engaged, right? That social component is so important. Um, <clears throat> and it's always good to have a strategy to combat the days that you don't feel as disciplined to obtain uh, those physical activity points. And uh, I said it before, but we, we have to genuinely find something that you like first, then build from there. And um, just because I like running or going to the gym, it doesn't mean that everyone likes that. And sometimes physiotherapists, we fall into a little bit of a, a stale pattern of showing these exercises that might not be meaningful to someone, but something else is, right? And, and it's our job to kind of find that something else. Uh, planning for barriers is always a really, really great strategy. Um, when you plan for barriers, uh, <clears throat> you, you're essentially mm, trying to improve your adherence and, and your own discipline to, to completing uh, your physical activities throughout the week. Uh, staying organized and creating solid, concrete, smart goals with your therapist or your trainer or your friends. Uh, say it out loud, tell them what, what it is or jot it down on a piece of paper to really make you uh, continue um, with your motivated approach and improving barrier <clears throat> specific self-efficacy. And that's, that's a mouthful for pretty much saying situation specific self-confidence to barriers. So a barrier I often find for myself is, uh, you know, a busy family life, busy career. I come home and the first thing I want to do is like sit down, <laughs> close my eyes and maybe like go to sleep or like just not do anything. Right. So one of my, uh, you know, strategies and that strategies that has improved my situation specific self-confidence is I know that if I, <laughs> I bypass uh, the living room and I head right down to my, uh, my gym or I head down to the area that I go and do my exercises, I will engage in them. There's a very high percentage uh, that I will do so. So I have my gym shoes and my, my, uh, you know, workout gear right in front of me. And I plan that the night before and I lay it out, 
right? So there's, there's really no excuses for me once I enter the home, I'm like, okay, this is all ready for me. I did the work to do this. All I need to do is slip on these shoes and then I'm, I'm uh, 50% of the way there. So that's an example of uh, improving your barrier specific uh, self-efficacy. Um, Melissa, you had a great question on uh, some of the videos. This is just a, a little bit of a slide on how we're active on social media. Uh, in addition, um, you know, all of these videos are complimentary. Feel free to save them, download them, um, use them to your own uh, you know, desire. But I, I would advise like if you're questioning like your abilities, perhaps asking a health professional or reaching out to one of us to kind of see like, is this meant for me? Um, and I think lastly, uh, if you only had 30 minutes a day to spare, so what, what's the best value for your effort and what's the best kind of like bang for your buck, so to speak, with regards to physical activity and exercise, um, Dr. Mike Evans gives a good, um, kind of talk on how 30 minutes a day, um, of, uh, simply walking. Uh, can really, really have a profound effect on a ton of um, secondary health conditions, in addition to improving all of the things uh, that we just spoke about with regards to exercise and traumatic brain injury. Um, I'm aware of our time right now. So this, this video is, I can share the link uh, at a later time. Um, and Melissa, do you, are you okay for a, like, I think it's like a five minute kind of uh, video. I can skip to the, um, to the parts that are a little bit more pertinent to our crowd. Yeah, that's great. Great. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and I'm presenting this visual lecture called 23 and a half hours in partnership with 24 hour fitness. It's great to be working with people who have a passion for helping others achieve their individual fitness goals and promoting positive change in their lives. So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word, but weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all these things are incredibly important, and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category. But I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What is the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? Um, so I did my research. And I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked out this intervention and because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems. And that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list. So this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47 percent in older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50%. For patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions, it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58%. Following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years, those that had the intervention had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue. And of course, the kind of outcome of choice there, my favorite outcome is quality of life, which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better. And this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is, what's the, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons. And, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm... Um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day so there's 24 hours and so you might spend most of your day you know this varies obviously but uh you know couch surfing sitting at work obviously sleeping and what um the evidence that i'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active maybe an hour and that uh, if you can do that you can realize all the benefits i've described in the previous slides so if exercise is a medicine what's the dose so when i think of, of of dose i think of how long how often and how intense i'm going to give you a slightly mixed message but essentially uh, more activity is better 
but I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day. So if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week or, or more, if you're a kid, an hour a day, if you're a kid, my fly goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that, um, you know, the literature draws a very broad brush. Uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something. Right. So pretty powerful stuff where it's, you know, the, half an hour worth of some sort of physical act up um, your day. Um, you know, if you had only half an hour to spare and 23 and a half of those hours are taken up from uh, life, uh, you can really gain a lot of uh, things through that. And, and, you know, certainly the health benefits that we spoke about and what Dr. Mike Evans is trying to drive home is a, it's not too late to start. It's never too late to start. So, you know, I think it's, that's an important kind of uh, message to send home to people. But also, if you haven't started, guess what? When you do start, you're going to reap the most benefits because you're starting from a spot where, you know, uh, you haven't done anything yet, right? So if you do start, every little bit counts and it will definitely, definitely help. So uh, with regards to uh, our goals for tonight, and we discussed some common physical uh, and neurological issues that arise after uh, an acquired or traumatic brain injury. We reviewed some physiotherapy guidelines and pra popular practices that can be implemented to address these issues. We know that movement is a component of medicine um, and there's some benefits to exercise and physical activity. We talked about some of the dosages and it varies from uh, population uh, and or samples uh, to, to one another, but it's tough to come by. More is better than none, uh, but if you had just a little bit of time in your day, uh, 30 minutes of some sort of uh, activity would be great. Um, and we talked about some of the directions and getting movement and physical activity into your day and breaking down some of the barriers or getting better at breaking down some of those barriers. So with that said, I, I, I do thank you guys for your time. Uh, I know everyone's really busy on a Monday and we wanna get on with it. Uh, this is our, uh, all of our account information. We do offer up a lot of um, free information, complimentary, uh, and uh, we're, we're located in Etobicoke, Pickering, and uh, Peterborough and the surrounding area. So I know a couple of questions came in. Sorry, I didn't have a chance to address them on the fly. Again, multitasking is not my forte, but I'm happy to take a look at them uh, right now if, you, if we wanted to go through it. I can even read them to you sure. <laughs> if you like. Uh, two things I put in the chat, not as questions, just as reminders, as you were talking about things people can do to our best family. I think uh, most people are aware we offer free yoga classes every week. So if you want to start with doing that and come out and join, you know, the best community to doing with doing the free yoga, uh, it's online right now, you can do that. Um, and we also have all uh, some of the sessions on our YouTube channel. So if you can't make uh, the best yoga class, you can always catch up on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, and I'm also going to share that we can, we will be sharing some of these videos that Hung shared tonight with everybody so that you can watch them at home. Uh, but we have a question from one of our members, Wynn. Uh, Wynn wants to know if you can speak about bicycling after a brain injury. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think with the, you know, the first thing that always comes to mind for everyone is, okay, our, our, how's our balance, right? And uh, how's our safety first? And, you know, with regards to the intensity of biking, I think, and using that as a source to obtain the benefits from exercise, I think that's an excellent idea, as long as the safety and the balance are cleared first. Um, if you're thinking like stationary bikes or uh, different kinds of um, different forms of uh, bikes that can help you with your balance and not being on the road, then that's also a really acceptable form. The intensities, uh, if you're asking more so on the uh, intensities, uh, they mirror uh, what was uh, referenced earlier. So, you know, uh, vig uh, moderate to vigorous and the RPE levels uh, of like 13 out of 20 uh, would be appropriate for those kinds of uh, that kind of cardiorespiratory um, uh, exercise. Um, if there's other follow-up questions to the cycling, uh, such as like posture and ergonomics and the best way to kind of set it up, uh, that would be more of like an individualized program and or a, an assessment for that. Um, but um, with regards to cycling for the same benefits, 
Absolutely. Great, thank you. Wendy, did that answer your question or do you have any follow-up? You can feel free to unmute yourself if that's easier. Oh, I see you. <laughs> when I'm not sure if you're talking, you're still muted, but I can see your lovely face now. Uh, yes. Um, the problem uh, I have is the traffic. Yeah. The, so you mentioned about uh, exercise bike. Uh, yes, because a lot of exercise are not related to traffic. So it's, it's yeah. safe. Uh, even the walking is uh, on the street. Uh, most people with brain injury don't have problem walking. I don't have problem walking except I dissociate. So I'm not paying attention. Right. Uh, even when I'm walking, yeah. So, so bicycling, it's it's. Uh, I have many bike accidents be because I didn't know that I should not bike on the street, you know. Because my my head injury was in childhood. Before I bike, right. before I drive, mm -hmm. you know. Slowly, I stopped driving because I learned that uh, I shouldn't drive, you know. So right yeah so 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 yeah exercise uh it's good but uh, uh on the on the street it's it's it's, it's not yeah, I, I, would, I mean when i would totally agree with you safety first right so if if it's a safety component uh versus like the actual ability to perform the biking uh, safety would trump uh, everything right uh so i think perhaps in in this specific situation like uh, having access to some form of a stationary bike or perhaps uh, having a setup uh, where you know you're trying the cycling in a really controlled area uh, we've gone with our clients to like empty lots before um, <laughs> and it's it's great to see because you know you, you get a chance to be trying the biking trying to bring it to a an intensity that's uh meaningful um, and without having as much uh, fear of you know uh, traffic or or running into any obstacles that way but i would say safety first and and to try some yeah. stationary biking for sure i i was very lucky the uh, many accidents by accident i i wear helmet so i i didn't have brain injury uh from the bike accidents only uh my knees and my legs, uh, but but uh, exercise bike are very boring, you know. So <laughs> so yeah. I found bike bike bicycling in, in the Woodbine Beach. It's a lot of fun, you know. Yeah, yeah I ride very slow and and you know, a lot of scenery, a lot of children, you know. So so it's fun. Yes. Maybe best we'll start I, yeah. a walking group. Maybe that's what we need to do. Is that sounds a like a group. really, really good idea. Yeah. We'll call it the hung uh, <laughs> walking group because you inspired it. Um, Amber, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to mute yourself and ask a question? Um, yes. Uh, uh, my name's Amber Lee. Um, in terms of something that Wynn said, I just, it sparked a curiosity. Um, earlier in the presentation, there was a mention that cross-country skiing is a good thing. Unfortunately, a little bit like um, when I didn't, I had uh, my a very large brain injury in childhood. And then um, it was noted, I guess, through the school system, but not understood by some. Mm -hmm. So there was some notation about cross-country skiing being good. And I did do that. And, um, I had like a special education teacher who was trying to be a little bit more vocal saying, no, she shouldn't be doing downhill skiing. Right. She was not vocal enough. <laughs> mm. And uh, I subsequently had about four other concussions downhill skiing oh, because no. no one actually bothered to tell me um, right. why I had these certain notations. Mm. So um, I, ended up going on two more school trips with the same teacher uh, who was advocating against the downhill skiing. Mm. And I didn't pick up on it. And when I changed schools, just graduating from junior high to high school, I then had another two before 
you know, four concussions later, you're like, you know, I think there's something with the downhill skiing and the right. balance. Yeah. Oh. Um, but yeah, that was a slow. Um, anyway, what I was mm, wondering about was uh when when had spoken about the walking and occasionally dissociating mm. it's not really a symptom that i associate with an injury mm. and then i was just sort of curious if that is um a bit more common as a phenomenon well that's a yeah i mean like that's a good question i i think i think from my perspective and scope i can really comment on kind of like the physical performance and the, the way someone is performing an activity or what their biomechanics and what their balance looks like. Um, I think from a dissociation point of view, like we, we do observe that. I can't say I've observed it in all of my clients. Uh, I think distractibility is a pretty big one as well. Um, and hence the reason why we're always kind of like preaching towards let's, let's make sure the safety is good first make sure the form and, and your abilities are there and then make this uh, physical activity uh, meaningful for you so that you can engage in it. It sounds like um, with regards to, you know, downhill skiing versus cross country skiing. Um, the reason cross country skiing is in that slide for cardiovascular fitness is that it takes a huge component of, um, you know, effort to, to go across a ton of snow uh, rather than, um, uh, going downhill, um, whereas that focus would be more on balance and being a little bit more on the, the technique of carving through the snow. Um, I did have one other question because sure, I'm yeah. trying to recall, and I just genuinely don't. Um, there was something, and it was on the BIS site, so that it might be a question a little bit more for Michelle, maybe, but um, there was something about getting a diagnosis of TBI. And I don't remember if this was, for some reason I thought it was Monday. <laughs> um, and I just don't remember when, and if it was Monday, I'd like to know, but if this was a different session, um, do you know which session I'm talking about? I'm um, not familiar. But. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Amber, I'm trying to think. So um, next week is uh, Laura Bellon, who's a, a worker at BIST, who's talking about social services. But in terms of getting diagnosed for brain injury, I'm not sure we've had a speaker talk about that. But if you are you asking about getting like a medical diagnosis of a brain injury or like a neuro like neuropsych testing to to monitor your your symptoms and your challenges? I genuinely actually thought it was um, a particular meeting in the calendar, and I actually thought one of them might have been today. Um, but from having a lot of notes in my school records mm -hmm. um, with the pandemic and not being able to float as easily in online environments, um, the school had said that we should center at this stage for neuropsych testing. So my school at the moment, because I'm in university, has been pushing neuropsych testing and asking me if I am um, open to it. Uh, so um, I imagine that they'll do that. Okay. Um, but I just genuinely was um, thinking it was some week and was thinking, oh, was it this one or was it a different one? And it wasn't this one. No, <laughs> wasn't this? Sorry, <laughs> but, but, I'm very, but it was very, very informative the whole way through. Um, I definitely appreciated it. Amber, what I'll do tomorrow is, um, I think you would have registered with an email address, so I will email you our links to our past workshops and what's mm -hmm. upcoming. And then, um, if you don't see it there, or if there's something that you're interested in, just let us know, and we can help see if, if it was something that in the past that was presented and if we don't have the notes we'll get them to you okay thank you you're welcome uh, and thank you for sharing uh with us tonight that was good questions so thank you um there's one more question in the chat about your clinic specifically mm. 
about uh, folks whose accounts are on hold. Right. Do you see clients? Yeah. What you yeah, I think, on? you know, uh, Amna, uh, if, if you don't mind, um, perhaps messaging us uh, privately on the side at our info at propelphysiotherapy.com. Uh, we'll be able to address that, uh, I think, a little bit more privately. And that way, yeah, we, we can address that uh, together. Uh, I know it's on the screen, but I'm putting your email oh, yeah. address Sorry. in the chat Thank as you. well. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so there it is. If anyone needs that again, you can reach out to the BIST office. We'll also get that over to you. Does anybody have any other questions for our guests tonight or for me? Um, I also put in the chat box, this is a bit of a plug of my favorite <laughs> exercise. Um, some of you may see in our What's Up Wednesday, we, we host adaptive climbing, rock climbing mm, sessions. Excellent. They're super cool. Anybody can do it. Um, they're really fun. Um, I think there's some being held next week. So it's usually about four times a year we host some sessions. So just keep an eye on the What's Up Wednesday. Um, and if you have any questions about it, you can also reach out to this staff as well. <laughs> Is it at a rock climbing place? Yeah, it's at True North Rock Climbing, which is close okay. to Downsview Park. Um, well, it's funny because mm, the first one that I had was so young. Um, throughout the presentation, uh, I've had like multiple times where I've had people reiterate the importance of many things that Hong went through. And I've even seen the 30 minute walking thing. Uh, <laughs> So, but uh, <laughs> they also uh, sent me a couple of times for rock climbing, which I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and they were also dumbfounded at why, because I was actually good at it, probably because I had done it a lot many times. Um, they were sort of like, it's, it's, it's very odd to know because they tried to see if they could eventually get me skating, could not eventually get me skating or rollerblading. So they were confused by mind you they're also teachers but they're greatly confused by why certain things sports wise it's like she's so inept at this but yet she does this so well <laughs> yeah you gotta find what works for you i think that was a pretty clear message too right like find what's uh, what makes you happy what you're good at and and i think just building off of that is great but that's great to hear yeah yeah, and I hope to see you out there, Amber, at the next climbing I'm session. Cool. It'll be fun. Um, I always laugh with Kyle. Kyle, and he he passes my area on his way to work, and I was it was a period of time where I was running. Um, I thought I was running, I should say, because when I saw Kyle, he's like, oh, I saw you going for a walk. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, I was running. Oh, no. So yeah. running is not my thing, but I, yeah. <laughs> other things that I enjoy you can always build up to it build up yeah. to it too yeah no, that's great <laughs> um all right if no one else has any questions or comments uh we will thank hung and propel physiotherapy for coming out tonight and speaking to us I know um I hope you don't mind me sharing this uh, hung just had a baby girl oh, so yeah. I know he's <laughs> he's tired and ready to <laughs> go hang I apologize to everyone have you heard her crying in the background we're trying to I'm just trying to get to the most opposite end of the uh of the house as possible but sometimes the crying is very loud so thank you everyone for your patience and thanks again melissa and bist uh, for having us uh, tonight so absolutely and we will absolutely share all the videos um, yeah. and if anyone has any other questions uh, you can reach out to us and we'll pass messages along to to hung and his wonderful wonderful team at propel all right awesome. so good night everybody have a good night thank you good night good night good night, good night. thanks melissa thanks and we'll see you later bye see you bye